Well, good afternoon to all. Professor Geert Tittendam, President of the Board of Directors of the University of Amsterdam, Minister of State of the Government of Costa Rica, His Excellency Ambassador Marcel Bukumbum, the Dutch Special Envoy on Climate Change, distinguished academic personnel and students of the University of Amsterdam, dear guests, friends, I would like to begin by thanking the University of Amsterdam, its president, Professor Geert ten Dam, and its rector, Magnificus, Professor Karen Meeks, for the invitation to address this relevant topic, which is perhaps the most momentous of the challenges that humanity is facing today and will face in the foreseeable future. I find it fitting that the reflections I am to share with you today take place at this university, in this city, and in this country. The Netherlands has been a living example of a small country dealing with the upheavals of climate and the environment and has shown remarkable leadership in both its adaptation and its conscientious approach to climate change. Costa Rica is appreciative of the many battles we have fought together in the international arena in achieving a meaningful approach to climate change <clears throat> and to the challenges of sustainable development which it entails. Many of those efforts were crystallized in Agenda 2030 of Sustainable Development and its 17 goals and in the Paris Agreement. However, on this topic, the march goes on and we are certain that we will continue to raise our voices in order to achieve the common objective of evolving towards a global low carbon development path in order to hold the rise in the global average temperature below 1.5 degrees and increase the ability to adapt to adverse impacts of climate change. While this may, might seem like a daunting objective, given the forces we are against, I can assure you uh, it is not if, all commit, we, if we all commit to raise our ambition on climate action. It cannot be disputed that the current profound changes to the environment have an anthropogenic origin and the resulting climate change is the, remain cause, is the main cause of the unleashed power of the natural events that we are experiencing at the alarming rate at which they are taking place. History is important, but it is far more important that we focus our attention upon the actions that need to be carried out. If the current trends of climate change are not addressed effectively, they may threaten our very existence as a species. There is a wealth of scientific data that allow us to identify the course of action to be taken to reverse or slow down climate change. The challenges are not just in the creation and implementation of policy, although it is, important, and it is an important part of the equation. More relevant is to achieve political will to achieve a global approach to climate change that provides the enabling conditions towards concrete action at the field level, both from small countries as of large world powers. The Paris Agreement is a historical success in harnessing much needed global cooperation. However, as science indicates, increased commitment on the reduction of emissions is needed in order to close the gap to achieve our goals. The urgency of this tax, task demands pre-2020 actions. Although we still must do everything possible to reverse the advancement of climate change, it is clear that its effects are already impacting us, to the point where policymaking must now also address in earnest issues of mitigation and adaptation, both mitigation and adaptation, and build resilience and sustainable societies. Climate action needed in mitigation and adaptation places a tremendous burden on governments and communities as the financial costs of addressing climate forces will need to come out of already overstressed public budgets. This may have, unfortunately, the trickling effect of affecting important public services and reduced our ability to achieve meaningful advances in eradicating poverty and other key development objectives. This burden appears to be more heavily placed on extremely vulnerable communities that are mainly made of women, children, the elderly, and people living in the situation of poverty. They suffer directly the full impact of climate change and at the same time 
are the ones that end up paying up the lion's share of the costs of policy implementation. A family headed by a female, which not makes up about 50% of all family nuclei in most developing countries, living in a marginalized community, almost always closed or inside a river, a coast or a fragile terrain, will bear the direct impact of stormy and irregular weather patterns. The rivers will swell more. The coast will be impacted more heavily by raising sea levels and the strength of natural phenomena. The fragile terrain will see more floods and more landslides, which with the consequent loss of property and or, and or human right, life. We have seen that recently in countries like Peru and Colombia, but we have also seen it in Costa Rica. For example, we just suffered the effects of Hurricane Otto, the first direct impact of a hurricane on Costa Rican territory in recorded history. So, how do we defend ourselves? Fortunately, we live in times of change. Convinced by reason and undisputable scientific evidence, several developed and developing countries around the world are moving forward under a new paradigm. These countries are moving towards uh, new low emission and resilient development pathways, working collectively for the construction of a safer, cleaner, decarbonized and more sustainable global system, fully address addressing required climate action and demonstrating that it is possible to have green economic growth based on efficiency and competitiveness. Costa Rica is well known on, on, to this regard because we have committed ourselves to becoming carbon neutral by 2021, which is you know, a, a significant and ambitious goal, which we tried to, we, will, we, we were doing our utmost to achieve. This is indeed good news, and we should do all our utmost effort in order to ensure that no regression takes place, either as a result of our own complacency or of geopolitical pressures. These efforts, including its financial cost, should be undertaken by governments jointly with the private sector, cities and civil society, and must be part of the efforts to mainstream climate action as central to the national development planning process. We believe multilateral action is the most enduring way to achieve sustainability in an age of increasing global challenges, because international solidarity and cooperation among states, large and small, and I would insist on this concept once and over again, it's not only a question of bigger ones, big states, it's also the, the, the responsibility of small states, is essential for achieving human development. International networks are indispensable to face the growing threats encroaching upon our planet's environment. We must also carry out truly effective actions of inclusive development, and those actions are mostly of a political nature. They are political because they entail a ground change in policy so that we can effectively address the basic needs of the most vulnerable. These policies imply universal access to high quality education and real access to means that may enable entrepreneurship and adequate job access. That is, good, stable jobs and well-paid jobs. Moreover, climate change related impacts have a range of implications, both direct and indirect, for the effective enjoyment of human rights. While these implications affect individuals and communities around the world, the effect of climate change will be felt most acutely by those segments of the population who are already in vulnerable situations owing to factors such as geography, poverty, gender, age, indigenous or minority status and disability. To this regard, I would like to, to, to mention the fact that Costa Rica and other 20 countries have been working on, on like-minded agendas to deal with, for example, the issue of migrations that could be the resulting um, uh, effect, effect of, of climate change and the moving, the masses of people moving around resulting from the lack of, uh, of, of, of territory where to dwell uh, once receiving the impact is something that needs to be uh, taken care of by the international community. As I pointed out earlier, women in particular bear the challenges and impacts of climate change to a disproportionate extent. Impacts are not equal to everyone. Therefore, their needs and their ideas, their work and their contributions 
must be given special consideration when dealing with these challenges. In this regard, I would like to recognize and to thank the government of the Netherlands for co-sponsoring, together with Costa Rica, actions focused upon developing a gender action plan for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. We intend to address the question of why women are not included as major actors and agents of change in climate action. We have recognized that worldwide, women refuse to be passive actors in the face of climate change. This is encouraging, and we must therefore look at this initiative as a way to ensure that no one is left behind. And we must ensure that critical actors in facing this challenge are fully integrated not only as recipients of policy, but actually as their architects. <clears throat> we also note that human rights obligations and commitments are integral, as they have the potential to inform and strengthen international and national policy making in the area of climate change, promoting policy coherence, legitimacy, and uh, sustainable out outcomes. Now, now, I would like briefly to address the importance of achieving carbon neutrality and moving towards deep decarbonized societies with net zero emissions and the challenges my own country is facing in achieving this important objective. Some of you may have heard me say this before, uh, but I believe that it is pertinent to explain the path that Costa Rica chose to go about these goals. More than half a century ago, Costa Rica established relevant policies towards renewable electricity production. Since the 1960s and to this day, hydroelectric power is our main source of energy supply, representing over 75% of the country's matrix. Just recently, my country made the international use for the extraordinary fact that in two consecutive years, more than 98% of electricity production was from renewable sources, with energy obtained from hydro, geothermal, solar, wind, and biomass sources, including several months with a record of 100% renewable energy produced. Today, 99.4% of all Costa Rican households enjoy access to electricity, thus improving significantly the quality of life of their members, many of whom are women living in the countryside. I believe that today we stand as world leaders in this feat. Costa Rica's decision to go renewable was now, it was in no way improvised. It forms part of my country's determination since its inception as a republic in 1848 to craft a political system profoundly committed to ensuring the common good through public education, other public strategic services, and solid democratic, democratic institutions. And allow me to say to this respect, and I like to, to quote this because it's a uh, it's a, it's a good indication of how you go about public education and much, most fitting to, to be said at a in a university context that the first girls' school in San Jose was inaugurated in 1839. That was almost 10 years, a little bit less than 10 years uh, before we became a republic. And from then on, uh, in 1869, we had a huge uh, elect uh, educational reform uh, that was meant to make of public education and compulsory compulsory policy for all the inhabitants of the country, um, and, and the, the constitution of the country um, establishes that up to 10 percent, uh, that, that up to 8 percent of our GDP uh, should be invested in public education from kindergarten and, and preschool to the university level, thus making of public education a significant factor in national development. Because um, the, su the successful implementation of this vision, profoundly impacted by the decision to become a disarmed country in 1948, explains why Costa Rica has been able to devote the so-called peace dividend into human development programs and to consider by, by international indices as one of the happiest nations on earth, a condition that we share with the Netherlands. It also explains why, with an inland territory of only 51,000 square kilometers and whilst being a mid middle income country, Costa Rica has been able to reverse deforestation and preserve 51% of its territory under some kind of either public or private environmental protection regime. This condition reflects our commitment to the world at large 
For ours, our small country hosts 4% of the world's biodiversity. Our strong convictions were also reflected in the constitutional reform of 1994 that introduces the right to enjoy an economically balanced environment. And this is um, something I, I want to stress because the Article 50 of our Constitution is the ultimate example of what I would uh, consider to be inclusive rights uh, because the, it, it says that the right to a clean environment is basically the right of every citizen. And, and therefore, which this implies is a, a completely different framework for public policy. Thus, after many decades of experience, we have learned in Costa Rica that in order to turn environmental awareness into public policy, a country has to go well beyond traditional conservation practices. This vision, quote unquote, has to be inclusive and to include other central factors, like public education, as I, I have said, probably being the most important of them all. That would allow the people to engage creatively and actively in the efforts of the public and private sector, sectors to generate sustainable-oriented actions. And to this regard, I would like also to make the point, uh, which I, I mentioned briefly uh, before I, we came here, that the whole issue of climate change and inclusive development, it's not a government issue. It is everybody's issue. And therefore, it is not a question of having or not having public policies, which, should, which we must have. It's a question of getting the citizens engaged in this, making people part of it, making everybody realize the personal responsibilities which, is, which it entails. Now, I don't want to become, uh, you know, to, to be criticized for putting upon the people the responsibility that uh, must be pursued by states. And there are indeed spaces where um, state action is unavoidable. But if this is not clear, if we do not have a personal ethic related to uh, the, the uh, concepts of sustainability as a, a, as a personal responsibility, this should, uh, is going to be a very difficult battle to win. Uh, hence the importance of education, hence the importance of, uh, of, uh, of, of young people being involved in it. In line with this historical trajectory, and in compliance with the Sustainable Development Goals, Costa Rica recently drew up its National Energy Plan with a vision to 2030. This national plan was the end product of an ample consultation process among social, political, academic, and business actors, and it is consistent with the national determined contribution the country presented to the Paris Agreement. Costa Rica presented ambitious commitments in Paris which maintain our early and visionary pledge to become carbon neutral by 2021, as I mentioned, in the bicentennial of our independence, which should be understood as the stabilization of greenhouse gas emissions at 2005 levels, and also commits itself to a much more ambitious goal, incorporating a reduction of 25% of emissions by 2030 compared with 2012 and by introducing the concept of deep decarbonizing of the economy, which implies the need for significant reductions of emissions until reaching zero net emissions by 2085. Other relevant elements of our NDC are the component of adaptation and considerations of, equality, of equity and commitment to human rights and equality of gender. These instruments and other important policies depict a horizon much more ambitious in terms of climate change and energy than they have ever had before. The energy plan integrates the electrical sector with the transportation sector, and it is precisely here where our biggest challenge lies. To significantly reduce the emissions resulting from the consumption of fossil fuels used for transportation purposes. This is an issue we must address and work out in the next few years uh, if we are to comply with, with our goals. And, and to this regard, I must say that, that uh, we have a, a huge car parking, uh, a huge um, uh, car problem. And, and this requires more massive transportation on the electricity sources, for example, an electric train. And, you know, to, to, because the, the, the bigger issue here, and it's a, kind of, it, it's a paradox, is the fact that we are producing 100% renewable electricity, and yet we have the city and the country flooded with cars. Uh, and, and here again, you know, we have to, st to stress 
the, the cultural aspects uh, that need to be changed. You know, people, uh, we should learn from the Netherlands, start using bikes more often. <laughs> not the only thing, but we should do that. Uh, in this regard, let us not forget uh, that Costa Rica also committed itself in the context of the Paris negotiation to act as a laboratory for the decarbonizing process worldwide. Allow me to reiterate this commitment and assure you of our continued support for all the efforts currently underway in order to implement the historic Paris agreements. We must vow to uphold and protect the integrity of those agreements, for they constitute a fundamental part of our patrimony. And I think all countries, uh, and especially like-minded countries like the Netherlands and Costa Rica, must insist in these times of uncertainty regarding the commitments that some world powers have done and, and that we're trying to back away from at this point, that these commitments are kept and we should be insisting and we should work uh, very, very candidly in support of these agreements because it, it took us a long time to get there. And in order to, um, if we go back on those agreements, the, con the, the, con the, the consequences could be catastrophic. Um, as part of this formidable task, we have launched the Green Hub, which is our proposal to accomplish these uh, this objectives. The Green Hub is an initiative to operate at the country scale as a laboratory for the decarbonizing of the economy. We are generating an ecosystem of innovation to pilot hard and soft technologies that are required in a new low emission economy. We want to operate as a laboratory for the implementation of projects, institutional arrange arrangements and technologies which would work as prototypes. The successful prototypes would be scaled up in other countries and regions. We see knowledge sharing as the key element for the Green Hub and we have st started knowledge sharing in areas where Costa Rica has been successful such as conservation and management of natural ecosystem, forestry management, and innovative renewable energy initiatives. We visualize the hub, as we, as we know this is an initiative, uh, becoming a global epicenter for triggering solutions of post-Paris society. Of course, these are ambitious, large-scale initiatives. Let us not forget, however, that, and coming back to inclusive development, we must also make sure that these initiatives reach all sectors of society, whether a Forbes 500 company or a small farming family with a two hectare coffee plantation. This should be our approach. And let me share with you what our farmers are doing. You may or may not know that coffee plantations, particularly at high altitudes, are grown on slopes and some of them can be very steep. This way of farming proved to contribute to soil erosion because in many instances, in order to plant the coffee, the forest and those slopes would have to be felled. When this happened, torrential rains would weaken the slope since there were no trees to retain the soil and erosion would take place. In addition, soil nutrients would also be lost. By educating our farmers on soil and plantation management, many of them are now leaving the trees without cutting them or are planting new ones in their coffee plantations so that erosion can be stopped and the soil may retain moisture and valuable nutrients. These trees in turn will help car capture carbon emissions. But those farmers are not only producing high quality coffee with fewer chemicals and, uh, and therefore making it possible fully organic coffee. They are also planting secondary crops, be these avocados or bananas or citrus fruits. So those two hectares are sustainable source. One, of course, society has to acknowledge and stimulate these efforts and help the farmers reach a decent living standards by recognizing a fair pr price for their products. In closing, I would like to add that although small in size, both Costa Rica and the Netherlands are respected and admired voices worldwide they are both recognized internationally for their strong advocacy for working towards decarbonized societies, for meaningful inclusive development, and for opening up pathways as to give voice to vulnerable actors 
to create the spaces for a gender, for a gender balanced approach to policy creation and policy implementation. I wish to thank the University of Amsterdam not only for giving us the space and the opportunity to address this relevant topic, but also for its extensive research and conscientious approach to climate change. The great Bengali poet and Nobel laureate Rabindranath Thakur, in referring to teachers, once said that while good teachers instruct and great teachers demonstrate, only superior teachers inspire. Being at this prestigious alma mater, I am certain that we all can be inspired and transmit the inspiration to generations of tomorrow so as to achieve the extraordinary quest of humanity to master the universe without harmony, mastering climate change with illusion and strength. I thank you very much. And now I think we have some time for yes. questions and, and answers. Yeah. Thank you. Well, you know, thank you for the questions. On, on, on the issue of education, it is almost impossible not to link it with the creation of knowledge. I mean, it's, it's not only instruction what we seek, it's the capacity to understand the processes. And uh, ever, evidently, there is no contradiction whatsoever between knowledge and an instruction. And I find it extraordinarily important to, to understand that we have to, to do both things. I mean, we have to disseminate information and therefore create this information. And in terms of, of climate change, we have to be very, we have to provide very hard information. I mean, and, and this, is the, this brings about the importance of research, which we know at the universities is a bigger challenge because it takes, requires funding and it requires uh, in interdisciplinary teams in the case of, of climate change, people coming from the social sciences, from the uh, um, uh, environmental sciences, from mathematics, I mean. But it is the question of understanding what happens, which I find particularly important. important. Because not all countries, and clearly um, Costa Rica may be an exception, uh, have the possibility of uh, of, of, of counting with formal education structures. So you have to have uh, a more open approach to, to this uh, so-called education. You have to, to be able to get to more people in formal or informal ways, within classrooms or without them. There are populations of uh, elderly people that should be involved as well. And mind you, and, and this brings, uh, where's the, our moderator? Oh, here you are. <laughs> this brings about your, your question of inclusion. I mean, how much information do we have from traditional sources, for example? The elderly who know how to do things and, and how to partake and when to, when to uh, pick up the, the crops and how to plant them and what kinds of combinations are good for the soil and to keep the soil. So the, the whole issue of education should not be necessarily um, tied up to formal educational uh, institutions or procedures. It should be seen as a larger complex in which uh, mostly knowledge should be stressed. Uh, Martin makes a, good question, uh, ma makes a good question saying, what's the relationship between NGOs and, and governments? Um, well, there are many, many instances in which governments and NGOs uh, enter into conflict, uh, in Costa Rica as well. You know, the stance we've taken in my government is that there is no contradiction necessarily between conservation and production, between uh, preserving uh, uh, the, the environmental goods that we have for the future and the needs of a growing population that require ac access to these resources in order to survive. Uh, but this is not only... Uh, this, is, this is a challenge that's not only shared by us, it's, it's part of the daily dilemmas in, in more developed societies. I mean, Costa Rica is not a conservationist country. We do not see conservation as a goal in itself. Now, obviously, there are areas in the country that cannot be touched, mainly national parks. Yeah, there, we are strict and, and not, but there, is a, there are gray areas in which we have to have sustainable policies in order to deal with um, the needs of, of 
one-fifth of our population that lives in poverty. And a good part of that population lives in the rural areas. And they require the, the, the resources that we want to preserve, but we cannot keep them from using. And this is where I find uh, the more uh, difficult uh, issues with NGOs. For example, in terms of fisheries. That's a bigger one. I mean, I've been accused of being the enemy of sharks, um, for example. And, uh, and quite frankly, I, I think that we have to be very careful because there are large amounts of populations which need to be included in the use of these resources and who, ha who have for generations dealt with the res these resources and they have been protecting them, in fact. Just recently, we, we provided 40 licenses, and it's, it's a very small number, but, but I think it is a very interesting case in point. We, we, we de gave 40, 40 licenses for women, most, mostly women, that collect mollusks, you know, kinds of shell, shells, in, um, in, in the coasts of Costa Rica, in one manglar, in a manglar, what's the? Mangrove, mangrove yeah, in the, in the mangrove lands. Okay. They have been doing this without a permit for decades, but they have also been doing the counting of the shells, they have been doing the replanting of the mangrove, and, uh, and, and now they have the permit to exploit the mangrove um, in, in a sustainable way. Well, you know, even the functionaries of our Ministry of the Environment were very, very angry. And they told me, you know, for several times, including, you know, at a very high level, that they were not uh, happy with uh, putting up these women using the mangrove. So I said, well, you know, the alternative is don't give them the licenses <coughs> and they will continue to exploit the mangrove without them, as they have done it every, every time since they were little girls. So, you know, and, and we, in that case, though, we, we had the support of another NGO who was willing to, to help them. So th there is a certain tension between government and non-governmental actions, but this doesn't have to be the case all the time. Costa Rica, for example, we have a very good collaboration between some NGOs and the police force um, in order to patrol our, 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 our seas. We have, you know, we're 10 times larger at sea than we are in land. We have over 500,000 square kilometers uh, of, of, of national seas because our possession of the Cocos Island in the Pacific. So uh, the fact that there are NGOs, for example, buying boats for the police force so that they can um, check on illegal fisheries or that we have NGOs uh, promoting uh, the awareness campaigns on certain species, etc., is something that we also find. So it, it, it goes from one, from one place to the other. Now, the fi finally, the idea of citizen citizens making the change. I absolutely agree with this. I mean, it is clear that uh, citizen participation um, is not only essential, but it is a key factor to make uh, successful, uh, inclusive environmental policies um, um, a reality. Um, what are some of the issues that I find um, is f are fundamental for citizens' uh, participation? Well, first of all, once again, knowledge. We have to assure the public with adequate levels of knowledge. This may, might be a problem with traditional media uh, that it, that's not necessarily interested in providing it, or they simply do not have this as a priority. But um, the, the, the availability of, of data, the availability of, um, of information is something that I find very, very important. Secondly, citizens' organization. Obviously, we all know maybe individuals that are very active and proactive in pursuing uh, certain goals, and that's very valuable. And I always, when I think of a citizen doing something that's extraordinary, I, f I remember, many of you do not remember this because you're too young, but uh, the, that uh, tremendous image of a Chinese stu student standing in front of a tank before the attack on Tiananmen Square. And that person there against brute force doing what he could, in this case was a boy, to, to prevent the tank from moving around. Um, but if we want to have an impact, we need to have many more citizens working together rather than individually. So I would uh, definitely uh, feel that um, creating organizations of citizens' actions are very important. Thus, 
the need to work with uh, local governments, with, uh, with, with private uh, entities uh, that will allow for, for the uh, organization of, um, of citizens. Um, so those are three ideas I, that, I would, uh, that, that I would propose. Now, um, one thing that we have seen in Latin America quite often is that sometimes certain citizens are more willing to work together and to show their solidarity and, um, and to share knowledge on issues that are uh, directly affecting their life, livelihoods. And one of those cases is women. I mean, the amount of women that are participating in communities, being uh, jefas de hogar, you know, mothers that uh, are, are, are taking care of their families, for example, and share, therefore, a common, a common need is extraordinary. The way in which they organize, the way in which they create uh, initiatives that imagine uh, solutions that many times are out of the box is something that, that we should treasure very much. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much for your, your questions again, Carolyn. Um, yeah, dams are, have been criticized, and, and uh, it is very difficult not to find any energy producing technolo technology not having some kind of darker side as you described it. Uh, either that or the windmills for the uh, eolic production and the air impact on birds, um, or what happens with the temperatures rising in and around solar farms. Um, so, you know, we, we, we have to take that for granted. It is going to, it is going to hurt somehow. Um, now, there are dams and dams. I mean, you, you can do good dams and you can do good policy of hydroelectric production and you can have very bad ones. Um, and to this regard, what, what we have tried to do uh, is using our nationalized uh, electricity institute, which has been very successful and became like the paramount example of the welfare state in Costa Rica since the 1960s, is to have this institute, which is publicly run, this is maybe a very important difference, okay, which is publicly run, um, create large uh, teams of experts that deal with the environmental impacts of the dam. They are the ones who plan the dams. And actually, our Institute of Electric Production is one of the very few instances in Costa Rica that plans anything these days. Huh? We have a more pragmatic approach to public administration, mostly. And uh, in planning ahead of time, they have the chance to look at the rivers, at the basins uh, of which uh, these rivers uh, form part. They look at the archaeological uh, remains that they might, that might be found. They have environmentalists looking at the uh, uh, populations of mammals. This can be significant for some of them, particularly feline, felines, cats, you know, the jaguars and, and other cats. Uh, the patterns of migration birds, uh, the kinds of uh, impacts that uh, uh, the dam may have on fish, on algae, uh, how to ensure that the dam doesn't cut across uh, pathways of migrations and, you know, in, in, if you have that and you have people, you get the commu community engaged, and this, they, this they've done very, very well. And again, when I, when I talk of communities engaged, I'm not talking in communities bought hmm, by perks, which they've done too sometimes. But, you know, engage in the sense that the community knows that they're getting something good from, from the dams. Then you can have a lesser impact on those dams. The largest artificial dam in Costa Rica is called the Arenal Lake. It's a huge dam in the northern part of the country, the center northern part of the country, which completely transformed, for the, for the better, I think, an area that has already very much environmentally impacted and that in having a lake was able to develop a huge um, ecosystem of uh, sustainable tourism uh, enterprises. And then you have the lake, and then you have boats, and then you have fishing, and, you, and then you have more tourists, and they come to little hotels, and, uh, and, 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 and a whole new region uh, is shaped by, by this dam. Now, you're right, dams um, are insufficient these days. 
because we have less water in the rivers and uh, climate change is bringing about a tremendous pressure on these rivers. <clears throat> Communities are also more resistant to letting the rivers be used for hydroelectrical purposes because they want to keep the water to drink or, to, or to, for agriculture. So in some countries in, in, in Latin America, communities are rising against dams, which are the ultimate example, or used to be the ultimate example of sustainability. So we also have to take that into account, and it is becoming more and more difficult for, uh, for, the, um, for, for hydroelectric produ production to be justified. Let me make you a confession. Myself, I took two rivers, um, uh, one on the Pacific uh, Vertiente, on the Pacific side of the mountains, and one on the Caribbean side of the mountain, away from the Institute of Costa Rica and the Institute of Electricity. And by decree, I, I, I decided that these were going to be kept untouched by dams. And they didn't like it. Okay? Because I, I, I agree with you that we should be very wise in the way we, we determine which rivers are or are not affected by dams. I mean, there are rivers already in Costa Rica with five or six dams on them. So if so, they are already impacted. So you know that's we could add up a dam maybe. Whereas there are other pristine, pristine rivers that we do not want to touch. Now the problem for us is how to reduce our dependency on hydroelectric plants. And, uh, and some engineers in, in, in the Costa Rican tradition have become, as some of my friends in the delegations call them, hydrocephalic. They only think in terms of water. <laughs> okay? Uh, and, and, and we want to bring them to another persuasion and, and, and make them understand that there are other options. And we're finding and seeking and, 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 and using other options, the clearest of which is geothermal energy. We have a lot of volcanoes, and, uh, and we're, we have been very successful in, in using geothermal energy for electricity production. Uh, we would like to bring electricity production to, around, uh, I mean, to geothermal production to around 18% of our matrix, further reducing the dependency on, on hydroelectric plants. But hydroelectric plant uh, electricity will continue to be the solid and the, the, the backbone of, of Costa Rica's matrix. There's no way around it. We started in the 1960s. You know, there were two things I could brag about with Madame uh, Merkel when I met her. <laughs> Only two. One was on our ener energy policy and the other one was on our education policy. You know, we could give lessons on dams, even to a world power as, 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 as Germany. So we, but, but, but the dam issue is something that we ne need to, to put into perspective. And I think that you're right. It is not necessarily the solution, nor the only solution, nor the best solution. It has worked for us, but uh, we have been very careful in dealing with, with this. And in fact, as we progress in time, it is becoming more difficult to convince indigenous populations in Costa Rica about dams. We have a consultation that's being carried at this time, actually this weekend, or last weekend, we had 7,000 7, participants in dealing with uh, the permit in order to assure the respect of the 169 resolution of the uh, world, uh, uh, the, yeah, the ILO, the ILO. So, so, so yes, we have to, as everything, we, we should be very careful, and, but it, it can be done. Now, now uh, David, on decarbonization ideas, um, yeah. One thing is, uh, I, I should be very, I should say that uh, each country is going to look for its own and better poss possibilities. Uh, there's no such thing as, as an answer to this. Costa Rica has been able to deal with decarbonization using two tools. One is the production of clean energies, and the other one is to have this huge amount of national territory spared for conservation practices, either complete in national parks or not. So this is something that that I think could be the case. But then again, the solutions that are, have been effective in a tropical environment may be not the same as in a non-tropical environment. And here again, uh, political will is very important. Are you willing or not of taking atomic energy, for example, nuclear energy, to produce energy or not? Are you willing to sacrifice sustainability in order to have cheaper 
energy sources for your economy. Our economy, if, uh, if our representative of the industry of cha the Chamber of Industries were here, he would say, it's, it's unbearable. We cannot pay the prices of your sustainable en electricity. It's just too much. It's up around 10, 10 cents per, per, per kilowatt in, in Costa Rica, and you can get in Central America energy as cheap as 3 cents using carbon or gas. So those are the bigger decisions. Are you, sacri are you willing to sacrifice energy clean cleanliness for uh, jobs? So, uh, so, but, but each case will be, will be different. And again, you know, on, on the Switzerland of, of, <laughs> of Central America and other hideous uh, comparisons, you know, I, I don't think that countries should be compared in that way. We obviously admire Switzerland very much. I also admire the Netherlands very much. I wouldn't mind at all to be called the Netherlands of Central America. Um, <laughs> Costa Rica to be called the Netherlands of Central America or, or the Finland of Central America regarding uh, education, but uh, it, it is always imprecise. I mean, we all have our traditions, we all have our ups and downs. Uh, I think that the comparison was, was basically uh, made because of the lack of an army, although Switzerland does have one. Uh, it's a citizen partisan army, different from others, but they do have it. Uh, and because of, of the well-being of the people, but no, societies are very different and uh, and I, I don't think that the um, comp comparing societies are necessarily a good thing to do. There is a, a point to be made, though, for good practices uh, to be shared and spared, as I mentioned in my, in my introductory uh, words. Um, and this is something we would like to, to continue developing in our quest to become members of the OECD. And, uh, and in, in, in that, if that's the case, then maybe we will all be able to call itself a little bit of everybody else, which is probably the best way to achieve this. Thank you very much. Thank you.